Anna Marie Cox, and having children won't make you immortal. <laughs> it will make you very tired, though, just to be clear. <laughs> Hi, I'm Daniel Dresner. How much did you read in my work? <laughs> Welcome to Space the Nation, where we look at science fiction through the lens of global stuff. warming. Political science and social science, I guess. That's our sort of general mix. Yes. If you if you sense a slight looseness in this particular episode, there's a reason for that, which is Anna and I are flying blind. We do not have a script for this one. <laughs> and the reason we don't have a script for this one is because we're closing out Hot Sci-Fi Summer with a sort of wrap-up episode of a variety of things that we have been watching and or reading, but have not had time to actually get into a full episode. Dan, I'm looking at this list. We didn't read anything. <laughs> <laughs> we read stuff. We just don't want to talk to the, we, you know, they don't need to hear the stuff we've been okay. reading. You know, yeah. Okay. All right. We've been reading yes. deep, deep stuff. <laughs> yeah. This is what we did on our summer vacation. Mm -hmm. And we're going to start from... Stuff we didn't like and didn't finish. Yes. Well, I fit. I finished. I. I. I fell on my sword for finishing it, but like, you okay. know, right. Yeah. Stuff we didn't like to yeah. stuff that we really liked. In fact, something that I got turned around on Ooh. that Dan tried to get me into, mm -hmm. and I finally gave it more of a chance and fell in love. In fact, Aww. binged the whole three seasons. Oh, this is great. I, now I have hope for the good place. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> so let us not delay our gratification or getting to it after we talk about the bad stuff, I, I guess. We're delaying gratification. We are. We are. We are. Well, also, we are. like, let's face it. It's going to be a little fun to rip some of these things to shreds. So that's, you know. Okay. That's, that's. All right. Let's, yeah. All right. So why don't we start with Marvel's Secret Invasion, which I think it would be safe to say <laughs> we did not enjoy. In fact, correct me if I'm wrong, you did not enjoy it so much that you gave up after the first episode. Yeah, I would say we could start with it because that's all I did. Yeah. I started okay. with it and mm -hmm. then I, I gave up on it. I mean, it it just was already seemed pointless and all these wonderful actors like... Leave it this way. Fantastic character actors. Yes. And I heard, I, I think Olivia Coleman get, gets, uh, people have pointed to her performance as being particularly good, even. She is legitimately through. good in uh, in her role as basically sort of an MI5 person who uh, is dealing yeah. with it. But, but I, I, I want to go on a rant here a little bit on it, because it wasn't just that I thought this show was bad. This show made me actively angry for a variety of reasons. <laughs> the first is, as you said, this is a fantastic cast, right? This is just like. Throwing whatever it is out the window. If I told you I had a, you know, something I was m producing with Olivia Coleman, you know, Emily Clark, Ben Mendelsohn, Samuel L. Jackson, Kobe Smulders, Don Cheadle, Martin Freeman, you know, uh, this is not a star. Yeah, this is a pretty good cast. Christopher McDonald has like a minor cameo in it, like like you know, like a, a small role. There are others who have like very small roles. Really good actors. And furthermore, if you had then told me, oh, we're not just going to make something. What we're going to do is like put like a Jean Le Carré style moody spy thriller, but set it in the MCU. Again, I'm sold on that because that's a genre they have. Sort of like Andor does like. Yeah, an to Star Wars. Right. Or, you know, to Star Wars. This yeah. It's going to be that. That would be perfect because they haven't really done that. Like they've done a lot of different genres, but like that's sort of one they haven't done. And that is clearly the mood they are going for. Which is fine, except that this is the worst fucking thing that has been written, <laughs> I think, since uh, Iron Fist. Like, uh, since since Marvel's Iron Fist. Yeah, no, it's that bad. Like, everything else we've watched, like, it, even in Phase 4, I think has had some redeeming value. The only thing of redeeming value in this show is Olivia Coleman. She's fantastic in it. She really is. I, this is sort of an interesting opportunity to talk about why Marvel tends to be okay. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, it's a good point. Is, yeah. It's it's because they tend to just take a really, like, you know, consumer product approach right. to this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's going to be basically good. It's going to be a quarter pounder. Yeah. Right? Like, sometimes there's it's There's a high floor. That. Right, there's a high sometimes, floor. Sometimes, yeah. right, there's a high floor. Sometimes yeah. you get something amazing. Right, sometimes like you I get a Black know. Panther or, you know, right. Thor Ragnarok or something like that. Sometimes you get something amazing. You're not always going to get that. But like what you're generally, as you say, like a McDonald's, you know, going in, you're probably going to get something of somewhat minimal quality. And this is not that. This yeah. is worse. That it was, was weird, too, because yeah. like even just the one episode I saw, like yeah. the performances are fine. Right. Yeah. 
it's just, it feels leaden. I've never seen a show that more appropriately seems to embody that word, I, leaden. I think the pr part of it might have been that this was a genre where you've got to have Cracker Jack writing to pull off. Because by yeah. definition, it's a dour genre, right? Like, these are all characters that are beaten down mostly because of the cost of waging, you know, this sort of intelligence slash counterintelligence operations, you know, it makes sense. And that that's entirely fair. That's consistent with the characters, but it doesn't know what to do with that. And do, go ahead. Do you think you could call this the McRib of Marvel movies? That's an insult to McRib. Product? I actually like McRib. Well, I'm just thinking like it's pre-processed. Yeah. It's like, it looks sort of like the thing it's supposed to be. Right. But they people actually it into the shape. People actually like um, the McRib. I think this is more well, like. I know, but they. Yeah. I, I think people like the McRib ironically. <laughs> and I, I, I don't think anyone actually likes the McRib. I like my Ooh. metaphor here because I do think. I'm not sure that's true, it, that Anna, but okay. Go they've, ahead. They've pressed this into the shape of a spy thriller, right? Yes. They've taken there's... these components and, like, and they've drowned it in sauce. Right. And it's still only vaguely edible. But it's I so I would go further than that, which is the reason there there are a couple of reasons this doesn't work, and I think they point to problems at the MCU, it, how the MCU is good and how the MCU is bad. It the MCU works if they embrace the genre and figure out how to fit it into a Marvel universe. Right. This thing embraces the genre; it has no idea how to connect it to 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 Marvel. And indeed, there's an even bigger problem with that which is the other the other thing that the the MCU has done incredibly well is demonstrate the sort of interconnections all of these different things mm. have it always suggests mm. there's a wider universe out there and it also pays legitimate attention to its own history this yep. show doesn't do that so like the premise of this show you know spoiler alert is that it turns out that there are about a million scrolls you know, living on planet Earth that Nick Fury didn't know about that his friend, I think Skolos, I want to say, I can't remember, the Ben Mendelsohn character, yeah. you know, brought in and didn't tell him. And the premise is that once people find out about that, oh my God, they're going to flip out, you know, aliens among us, which raises the super awkward question of, again, in the world of the MCU, Earth has been aware of aliens for at least a decade they almost lost New York. They almost lost New York. <laughs> but furthermore, they've welcomed other aliens. Like, there's new Asgard in, on Earth. Oh. So, like, you know. And, like, half the world disappeared. Right. You know, like, I mean, I think people are are, are able to accept the extraordinary. Like, well, we have sort of... <laughs> So to actually, to it, place. I would have been okay. We believe the unbelievable right. at this point. I would have been okay if they had suggested Earth's been through a lot with the blip and so on and so forth. This news could actually cause people to, you know, act in even yeah, weirder yeah, ways. Yeah. That would have been fine. They don't do that. They don't even talk about that. Again, that was, you know, and then there's other reveals. Like we find out that Rhodey, you know, was a scroll. Although he is, by the way, uh, you know, again, spoiler alert, the real Rhodey is alive and like he's freed at the very end of it. So what we don't know is how long he was a scroll. By the way, the Martin Freeman character, the CIA officer, also Everett, also a scroll. We don't know how long that's happened either. There's no attempt to sort of connect it to everything else, which is frustrating. And then the other, <laughs> needless to say, the other, the other frustrating thing is, is that, again, the plotting is just bad, you know. Nick Fury shows up at various times and you're wondering how the hell he's doing this and like what is actually going on. And I think the thing that I'm actually most upset about is they kill yes. Maria Hill. Kobe Smulders is actually dead at the end of this. And she was killed for like first. A, yes. First, like at the, at the yeah. first episode. And you know, this is a character who's been around for 10 years. Kobe Smulders has imbued her with, you know, you, you care about her. It's meaningful that she dies, but she dies in this dreck. It's like, you know, it's just a wasted it's a wasted death, I guess would be the way to put it. And then the weird thing is, is that the show then goes on to not take any other death seriously because you think you keep thinking characters have died and then they wind up getting like resurrected. And so it's just bad. And, and, and by the way, the one thing I will give the show credit for is that it ends on a very ugly note because it ends in this like the revelation is, oh, there are these scrolls out there. Everyone knows about it. And you see like mobs of people killing people that turn out to be scrolls, but then killing people that they thought were scrolls that aren't. So like, it makes it clear this is an ugly outcome, but it doesn't know what to do with that. So like what, what, what I find infuriating is that clearly this show was given somewhat greater license to do a more mature themed episode 
or more mature themed show, and it just shit the bed. There's no other way to put it. <laughs> That's what they wound up doing. Yeah, I'm trying to sort of go back to like what was the mistake here in terms of the consumer product, and I wonder. I I, I still like my McRib analogy <laughs> in that I they didn't know what. They thought they knew what they were doing. They thought they knew the product they were developing. Yeah. But they only knew it in this like vague form. Like didn't understand the the real nitty gritty of it. Whereas like when something is really good, I mean, that's when you get like a direct. For one thing, I think part of it has to do with it being a TV show. I think you mm -hmm. need a really sure hand. Yeah. Much like what's his face in Andor. Uh, Tony was, Gilroy. Tony Gilroy. Tony Gilroy in Andor. Yeah. I mean, because if you look at the best of the MCU, it's Ryan Coogler, it's mm -hmm. T T Taito Wai T T Taiko Wai T T Taito Wai T T. <laughs> sure, him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or even, but even the Russo Please brothers. Anything. The Russo brothers know what they're doing yeah. with 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 this. You know, I would say they're a little workman like, but like the really good stuff yeah, has yeah. like a really sure hand. Right. It has someone, and and they have a vision, yeah. and like our. I feel like this is the mantra, the thing that. The years that we've been doing this show, I feel like the one thing that I have discovered that I didn't know how I, much I appreciated before is what passion counts for yeah. in a project, and I will, is what vision and passion counts for. And that was frustrating. And, there is no passion. I think that's the other problem. There's no passion in this. Some of the other phase four shows, you know, She-Hulk, Attorney at Law, or Ms. Marvel, or even the-, the I think Moon Knight had a, Moon Knight. had a certain passion to it. Yeah, yeah. but like those, like I, there, there are some criticisms you can throw at those. But those were good shows where you got the sense that whoever the showrunner was had a grasp of what they were going for, and there was general competency as well as some like delightful moments and so on and so forth. This has none of that, and again, it's just, again the only bright spot on in this show is Olivia Coleman. That's I, you know there is a final fight that's mildly interesting. It's the one like actually this show is interesting also because there's not a ton of special effects either. Which was appropriate for what they're doing, but like it just, I think the thing that makes me annoyed is not just the, is that they, it was a wasted opportunity. And it does yeah. seem emblematic of, of where Marvel has been recently, where it's like they're running a little on autopilot and they've forgotten why they're, what made them good. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little worried about our Marvel. Yeah. Which brings us, yes, actually, oh. to the next thing on our list, yes. in a way, mm -hmm. which is, Flash. The Flash, yes. Now, right. which, which to if, the you're, if you're a, if you're a little worried about Marvel, you should be a <laughs> lot worried about the DC. <laughs> right. So now I'm going to confess I have not seen the Flash. You Anna, saw the Flash. Right. I believe it just came out potentially, or was about to come out on Max. So you know, hopefully our listeners will have a chance to watch I, it. I and yeah, it came out right after the strike started because it, right. they couldn't do any publicity for it, yeah. which is another reason why it tanked. Although it's probably going to tank anyway because Ezra Miller's more than problematic. I mean, I think. Oh, has there been a problem with Ezra Miller? I wasn't aware. <laughs> I mean, I I don't want to talk too much about that because I think it's a sad story. Yeah. Okay. I think I think that he's someone who I I genuinely have some empathy for and wish the best two and i've probably said it in this on this show but like the the toughest people to save from like their own mm -hmm. demons are rich famous yeah. men <laughs> <laughs> in particular because they're just they people just let keep letting them do stuff i think always going to be people who let them do stuff this way there's an interesting parallel here to robert downey jr actually because you can argue the mcu is not the mcu without robert downey jr and it took what two three decades for Robert Downey Jr. to finally get his shit together? You know this yeah. is this is a, a deeply tortured human being who finally managed to write himself. And I would argue, I, it was way I agree with you in the following sense: Ezra Miller is a talented actor. I've seen him oh in enough God, stuff. Oh my God, he's so good. He's he's good he's so in good. a lot of different things. Yeah. And so I hope he gets the treatment and help he needs because yeah. we would all be better for it. If he's actually yeah. a working actor, but that said, right. he's done some bad shit and needs to get his head on straight. Right, and but to talk about the Flash, yeah, okay, you can't talk about the Flash without talking about him a little bit, right. obviously, because he makes it. Mm -hmm. He's incredible. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know, I didn't read anything about it that that made a big deal about this, but I think it's a big deal, which is you know he plays two characters. Mm -hmm. And I never thought about that the entire movie. That is a credit to acting, like you know, yeah. 
Yeah. I <laughs> never thought about, oh, he must be talking to himself. Like they're putting this scene together right. in a way that he's talking to himself. But that's also, I just, that's good. Like also that's great. That's not just great acting. It's great non showy acting. Cause sometimes you see something yeah. you're like, wow, they're really acting. And like, that's actually not the best impulse to have sometimes because you just want to sort of watch the performance rather than sort of notice it. And so that's interesting that he's, he's good enough to do that. I also appreciated that it's a kind of, it's, the DCU thing is supposed to be it's darker, right? Yeah, but yeah. sometimes it's just silly. Like when we've talked about the bat, any any Batman movie is kind of silly. <laughs> like I all I don't know if they're I like some of the Batman movies, but I find them their self seriousness. Like I never quite you never quite buy it. Never quite get there with it. Is there's there's something deeply silly about Batman, and we've talked about it, which is that if you have that kind of money, you should do better <laughs> than beating up random criminals be a better philanthropist <laughs> bruce come on man <laughs> that is the fundamental problem with batman is that he's going about this all wrong mm-hmm. so the flash has it has a cool darkness to it mm-hmm. i would say ezra miller's incredible and it 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 just sort of then it it, it doesn't resolve itself in a way that's very satisfying hmm. it pays it does this weird shtick where you see all the different versions of every dc you know, universe like they do. You see a CGI version of Nick Cage. Yeah, I heard that. Superman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. which you know, it's like fan service, and fan service can be okay. Yeah. Except one of the things I kind of liked about the movie was like it was pretty like dark. You know, grim. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it had, it had some silliness too, but there were stakes. There were stakes, even though it's an alternate universe. Well, this is based on the Flashpoint paradox, right? I think that was the, yes. That's the the sort of well-known epic sort of comic run that this right. is based on oh and i gotta say and michael keaton is i mean i love loved seeing him don the bat costume that's again. good so, no, this Great. Is, i'm wait i'm wait i'm gonna watch it if for no other reason just to see keaton again is the batman yeah that's good and i want to tell people about ezra miller I, this is another thing very important to say if you haven't seen we need to talk about kevin mm-hmm. that is one of the most disturbing movies out there oh i'm never gonna parents. watch that yeah i was gonna say yeah parents, parents this is a non parent warning parents parents. should never watch that film there's so, like Anna, i know you're you're talking about like you were joking at the opening about children and mortality there is something about becoming a parent where there are certain films i will never watch because i don't like there was a movie that came out i think it was dennis uh, villeneuve's first film prisoners about missing children oh, i won't see that either yeah, yeah no no, no. That actually nope. no nope not forget it I don't think I would have watched We Need to Talk About Kevin if I had known how good it was going to be. <laughs> like, I knew the sort of general, you know, plot. And it's, I, I think, I'm no, maybe spoiler, but I don't think so. It's about a school sh- shooter. You're right. shooter. It's about a, a young man who turns into a school killer. And his parents, say. correct? Like, yeah, I mean, it's mostly. And, and his parents. Yeah. And Tilda Swinton is his mom. And it's just, mm. God, it's good. It's just, it's, it, it is so disturbing. But yeah. the entire time... You're, and it's yet it's not showy either. You're just feeling it yeah, yeah. with them until the Swinton, especially. God, you, mm. Anyway, let's move on. Okay. And what's but, but, wait, hold on. Didn't Be- before we close, okay. I do want to ask: Would you recommend? So, would you recommend people watch it or not? Like, you know, if you've already subscribed to Max, <laughs> there we you go. Know, there we go. Like, if you're not, if you're not giving more money <laughs> <laughs> in that direction. I think it's a good, it's not a laundry folder because it actually takes a little bit of like. Attention. You, you, you know, need to. Attention. Yeah. But I, I enjoyed it. Okay. I found it diverting. I, it did not get good reviews, but like I said, I, I think the thing about it is just Ezra Miller's like cool to watch. And it's an, the, I guess the plot is stolen from the Flashpoint Paradox. Well, it's stolen. But it's it's a, a cool plot. It, it's adapted. I mean, not it's, stolen. It, yeah. it's, it's adapted. I mean, so it's not like it's not like a new. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 But it's, it's a, let me put this way. There's a reason they adapted that plot. It's a good plot. It's a cool plot. See, it's like a good there, plot. There's it's, an animated. It's, it's, it's um, interesting. There is an animated version of this film called. Uh, there's an animated DC film called The Flashpoint Paradox. By the way, so just also you know okay. something. Oh, maybe see. I'll watch that. Yeah, yeah. I enjoyed it. Okay, so like medium thumb in the middle. Okay. Like no thumb up, no thumb down. Just like. All right. Next, Catch it if you want. next on our you know steadily upward trajectory of of crap is Ahsoka, which is also at Disney Plus. Skipped it entirely. So Dan, what do you got to say? I don't have to say much because I have not watched much of it, but I will. I will say two thing, three things about it. The first was is that <laughs> four. No, four no, three, things. three, no, three, wait. three, five, okay. seven, no. <laughs> <laughs> One of them will just be in R2-D2 voice. No. All right. So the first thing is, is that 
I read one review, like it was a headline thing that made me think, oh, I'm not going to like this because someone literally described it as the anti Andor. And I'm like, Ooh. no, no, I want more Andor. Don't, don't tell me yeah. it's the opposite of that. That's not promising. And so having watched a little bit of it, I see where they're going with that in that the great thing about Andor and the reason that I think Tony Gilroy, you know, has actually worked in terms of Star Wars, and in some ways this connects back to our discussion of the MCU, is that Tony Gilroy actually doesn't give a fuck about Star Wars. He really doesn't. He's been Famously. very blatant about that. Yeah. <laughs> now, you obviously need to, like, make sure he doesn't, you know, ridiculously violate canon or anything like that. I mean, I, I, I like the universe enough so that you want to make sure he doesn't do ridiculous stuff. So you need a couple people mining him. But this allowed him to do things that I think you know, other Star Wars showrunners or producers or directors might have been too slavishly devoted to the No canon. sacred cows for Tony right. Gilroy. As near as I can figure out, Ahsoka is nothing but sacred cows, <laughs> is the basic <laughs> problem. In that way, it is the anti-Andor, because, you know, it follows a character, Ahsoka Tano, who, for those who have watched the animated shows, particularly Clone Wars and, I think, Rebels, this is a character that was in those animated shows. She's played by Rosario Dawson. We've seen her in live action before in The Mandalorian and in The Book of Boba Fett in like one episode apiece. What, and, and she seems to be doing perfectly fine. But I will say, first of all, I laughed in not in a good way at the beginning of the show because the show opens with what should be a traditional Star Wars crawl. But instead, it's like just like, you know, exposition going up the screen and it's written <laughs> it is clear i think i have to assume that whoever did this wrote it thinking oh yeah we're totally gonna get to do the classic star wars you know episode whatever ahsoka and they're like no you're not gonna get to do that but they kept the the crawl <laughs> and the crawl includes other thing the mcguffin at least in the first episode is i swear to god a fucking map on a because that's never been done in a star wars thing <laughs> Forever. Right. <laughs> and so I'm like, ugh. And like that was my reaction upon watching like the first parts of it, which is just that, okay, you're going to the exact same goddamn well again. And like, I have no doubt that like there's gonna be some stuff that's good in it, particularly for those I suspect who did watch those animated shows, because really you're seeing all these characters come to life. So it's got a great cast. You know, beyond Rosario Dawson, there's Ray Stevenson, there's Natasha Lou Bordizo as uh, Sabine Wren, Mary Elizabeth Winstead as a rebel general, and and Anna. Uh, do you want to also know who's in it? I I think you're going to tell me. Wes Chatham. <gasps> Your boyfriend. Oh. Yes. So maybe you should watch this. Wow. Haven't seen that boyfriend in a while. I yet. know. So good for Wes Chatham. You know, yeah. that, welcome back to the genre. And look, maybe this will turn out better, but... I have to say of the half, you know, the, the, the bits I watched of the first episode, it kind of seems like it, the thing it most reminds me of is the force awakens, <laughs> which is not, which is not all okay. bad. Like I, I actually like the first half of force awakens, but unfortunately it reminds me of the not good part of the force awakens where it's like, they're doing everything possible to tie it into like the larger, you know, canon and, and to some extent sacrificing things like character and, you know, interesting themes. So th maybe this has potential. And it, like I think the first two episodes of, as, of this recording, there are only two episodes out. So maybe it will improve. But my hunch is, is there really is going to be the anti-Andor. And that is unfortunate for everyone concerned. You know, it's funny. I actually just don't, you know, I am a child of the original Star Wars movie. As am I. I yes, uh, we're, uh, we're, and, we're locked uh, in there. Yeah. And nothing beyond that first trilogy has ever meant as much to me. And even Andor never. Oh, OK. Andor is the exception. OK. Andor would be the, the exception. I mean, I've enjoyed other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. Rogue One was good. But yeah, sure. But I it doesn't feel the same to me. And I know this is like I, there are folks on our discord that are like hardcore extended universe. Well, let, let me put it this way. I think the answer to the question of should you watch this, I honestly think in part is generational, which is, Anna, you and I are Gen X. As you say, we grew up in the original trilogy, which was magical in a variety of ways. And they've occasionally managed to do other things that are interesting. I think we like Andor for very different reasons, though, from oh, yeah. liking the original well, trilogy. Yes and no. Okay. 
I would say that it's still very Gen X-y yeah. in that it's oh, yeah. too, super fucking cynical. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like the point but is- it is just a different, it's just different. It's a whole it's different not, vibe it, from it the original try trilogy. It to be the original trilogy. Right. And it still fits in with the larger universe, which is great, but like it's a very different vibe. This is a something that is clearly trying to evoke, for lack of a way of putting it, the vibe of the animated shows and of the Clone Wars, which have their fans, and I suspect millennials and maybe even Gen Z will like this better than older folk like you and I. And I'm honestly curious on the Discord if people like this. I want to know. I want them to out their ages because I, I actually think that <laughs> might be the divide on this one, which is people who grew up on these characters in animated form might enjoy this more than you or I did because I, I wasn't going to watch. I wasn't watching Clone Wars when it first came out because, yeah. you know, I'm a goddamn adult. <laughs> right. I mean, I was just going to say, like, I'm. For, I've never actually really thought about it this way because like my experience of Star Wars has been so much like, all right, well, there's the original trilogy yeah. and then everything after that. Right. That's what it is. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Like there's like whole generation for whom the first thing they saw mm -hmm. were the animated series. Right. And by the way, I just want to take a quick moment now to once again curse out my wife for making me when when my children were young and like I I like one of the things I was looking forward to when my children were young was introducing them to star Wars. I, you know, like you, uh, okay. you know, this is, yeah, this is something sure. as a parent, like there are certain cultural things you love. You're just like, Oh, they're going to love this. Like princess bride right. or Monty Python or so on and so forth. And so with star Wars, you know, got, got my son hooked on it and he, he liked the original trilogy and so on and so forth. My daughter was getting older and she originally wasn't a keen fan of it. And I was actually able to convince her, okay, look, let's watch the first 20 minutes of star Wars. If you don't like it, I'll turn it off forever. And we don't have to talk about it. And she was old enough that after the after twenty minutes, she was into it. She's like, "Okay, I want to watch right. more." We watched the first half of the Star Wars. Then she had to go to bed. And then I went to a, I had to go travel for a conference. And when I came back, my wife had shown her the first trilogy, you know, the the, the original trilogy, which she was really into. But then she wanted to watch more, so she I had to watch oh. the prequel fucking trilogy with her. <laughs> and that's love. Okay, that is love. And my poor daughter, who like you know, perfectly liked you know things like Jar Jar Binks because she was young enough to you know to to think like that. Five, and right? yeah, and yeah, I'm watching it and thinking, oh, this was actually worse than I remembered it. Motherfuckers, goddamn God, George I fucking Lucas. Being, I remember being upset at the theater. This oh is yeah, apparently a common Gen X thing. Oh yeah, no, no, no. We remember watching it and being like, "Fuck you, George yep. Lucas." Oh no, no, like, no. absolute. <laughs> Adults have disappointed. Boomers have disappointed what? us again. You thought Gen Xers were cynical before the before the Phantom Menace came out? Oh no, that was like you know that's where we became hardcore cynical, like absolutely. Yeah, right. But totally. So my point is, my recommendation for Ahsoka is if it wasn't the Iran Contra. No, no, no not Iran Contra. <laughs> no, 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 not that. Not not you know impeachment of Bill recession. Clinton. Not none of that no. stuff. No, no, it was the it was without question the Phantom Menace. That was an you know yep. important touchdown. Okay, so anyway, my recommendation is is that if you grew up on the original trilogy, I don't necessarily recommend you watch this. But if you liked you know the Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels, go to town. You probably enjoy it. All right, Anna, what are moving we moving on? Moving on, Dan. Next is Foundation, yeah. season two on Apple. Now, you might be a little further along than I am, because I think I've only watched the first five episodes of this season so far. There is a one out today oh, okay. that I have not seen. Okay. Episode seven. Okay. All right. So you're a little further along than I am. A little further ahead. I think we can safely say that the books are just in the in the rearview mirror. And you know, thank you, shredded. Thank you, David Boyer, <laughs> for that choice. I'm not sure this is good, but definitely I do not need to see a filmed version of Asimov's book. No. That's right. Nope, uh, nope, nope. They are just, it's just, it's just like they tore him up, threw him in the air. Yeah. You know, I kind of feel bad. I, I do watch, I think the, the channel that I watch the recaps on <laughs> is Pete Peppers' channel. New Rockstars doesn't do foundation recaps, which I'm kind of sad about that because I'm a fan of their recaps and yeah. other things. Okay. But Clearly, Pete Peppers is a big fan of the books, and he'll like do oh, no. little book comparisons. Oh god! Well, now he and, must be tearing his hair out at this point. No, I think I, he's whatever. He's a good sport. Okay, like genre right. also. Okay. he's got he's got a he's got a channel to sell stuff, so he's got a you know. Mm -hmm. I think there's a limit on how much you can hate things once you've <laughs> gone that direction. He'll just be like, "Well, book book readers will recognize this name. <laughs> book readers will recognize this name." <laughs> 
<laughs> you'll recognize the name, the character. Who knows? Yeah. But you'll recognize yeah, the name. Yeah, yeah, that's the clear. The clear implication. Sometimes yeah. he just says it. Is like, well, these are little Easter eggs for the book readers that we recognize <laughs> these names. <laughs> You know, and some of them are good names. Hobar Mallow. Hobar Mallow, Great yes. Name. That is a good name. I love from, that is name. Is that from one of the later books? Because I, I couldn't remember if that was from the I original I believe book. it is. Yeah. You know, I read, because I read the first one, and then I think I started the second one. And before I was just like, this is ridiculous. Like, everyone is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> These are not good. <laughs> so that, like that, frankly, what I felt like watching Secret Invasion. So, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> everyone is wrong. Everyone is wrong. <laughs> Okay, but so what do I think about this season? Yes. Though? I I mean, I enjoyed the first season. Like, I think a little more than you. It's not it's not great, mm-hmm. but there's good performances and there's Lee Pace. Like, it's just... <laughs> Lee Pace as Cleon, uh, or as, as Day, I think it would be the better way to as put it. As Day. Yeah. And yeah. also, I think the other two Cleons are good, too, although they're not Lee Pace. I mean... <laughs> And it's 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 beautiful. Like Apple has just cornered the market on beautiful this sci-fi. certain look yeah. to sci-fi that other networks don't have. It's very actually. This lush. is well. Let me put it this way: I, the the colors are really great. I don't know if it's just like I don't know what they're doing. I will say Andor. Like this is another area where Andor. I think it, Andor is the show that actually comes closest to this in terms of like. Again, Tony Gilroy was smart. He uses mostly physical, like real landscapes. And yep. that that works incredibly well for Andor. And I think that's mostly true for Foundation as well. And that I agree with you. The best thing about the first season was the cinematography. It, it, there's some just gorgeous, gorgeous shots. This season is, I again, I have mixed feelings about it. How would I put this? It's goofy in some ways. Like, And I think it's almost self-consciously goofy. Yeah. I Like, like it... You know, the, the the thing that struck me, the, the goofiest moment by far, did you see, I, I'm sure you remember this, is when there's a scene in, in, I think, the fourth or fifth episode where Day is supposed to be betting his, you know, fiance. And the fiance right. is trying to get in there because she wants to see the assassination attempt that happened in the first episode. And right. we learn that, that, among other things, Day has been sleeping with the robot Demerzel. You know, they've just been banging on a regular basis, apparently. Yep. And as Demerzel, like, you know, encourages him, you know, it's like, it's okay, you're going to- Oh, be I know, I know, yes, okay, yeah. Demerzel yeah, is I like, Demerzel, like, you know, he, Day is understandably nervous, because like he's- He's never had sex with anyone else. Right, exactly. That's actually the thing. So, he's never had, only had sex right. with his former wet nurse or whatever, which is, you Just know, weird, fine. yeah. So Demerzel, let's just say, gets him all hot, hot up and bothered, which is fine. And then as she's leaving, gives a little thumbs up, Today, which is like, I honestly want to know. It's not a thumbs up. It's a fist pump. Oh, is it a fist? I thought it was a thumbs up. All I know is it is the most absurd gesture. Yeah. (laughs) It's the most absurd fucking gesture. And there's part of me that wondered if the actress did it as sort of like going for the blooper reel. And they were like, no, 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 let's use this. That's great. That's great. But like like, that was never been in the first season. And that would certainly never have been an Asimov's thing. No. And it does sort of raise this interesting point, which you know, you don't think about a lot because I think most sci-fi kind of either consciously incorporates, you know, the gestures and aphorisms of our modern times. Right. It's just like, that's just people, people still, still say like cool. that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People still give thumbs up. People still whatever. Mm-hmm. The foundation hasn't done that. Right. <laughs> right. Like they don't say they don't use the vernacular of our our earth time. But apparently people still give fist pumps, which I don't know, like that, it is a little weird. You know, I thought that that, that also the stuff with Harry, like when he suddenly is like- Oh, he's flushing blood physical again. Physical again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, I thought that was kind of like, oh, I guess they're just, they're just going to do it. Also really goofy. It's, yeah. He, it's and they almost seem to acknowledge it. Like Harry's, like, yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> There's, I, I, let me here, here I am. <laughs> the way I would put it is, the show is at least self conscious about the fact of, yeah, we're really, you know, we're look, we we literally like Jared Harris. Okay, you literally like Jared Harris. You want on the goddamn yes. show? Stop your fucking complaining. Okay, like that's pretty much yeah. the, the the attitude they seem to have on that. Point. Yeah, but that's the kind of fan service I can I can live <laughs> with. I like that. We, sure. Also, again, Lee Pace just. Lee Pace More is very Lee good. Pace. Oh, and also, who's the guy? I can't remember the name of the actor who plays the general. Fantastic job. Oh. The acting continues to be great all around, which is was true the first season as well. It's just, it's just, it's kind of a silly show. I mean, it was 
I think, and I love that they're kind of burning their bridge back to the books. And I wonder <laughs> who is left to watch it, unless it's just people uh, like me who like Jared Harris and Lee Pace. <laughs> so I believe you're referring to Ben Daniels, who plays Bell Rios. That is the yes. general. Yeah. I w- Readers will recognize that name. <laughs> yes. Um, I want to give a shout out to my new girlfriend, Ella Ray Smith, who plays Queen Sarath. Oh, she's she. She's, yeah. I gotta say, like, yeah, I, I, again, I wouldn't kick her out of my bed. Either. Thank you, Anna. Like that's, like, but leave this way. She again, it's good acting because let's be blunt, she's not given a ton to do. Right. You know, she has to look super hot. That is clearly obvious, but she does more with that role than I would have expected. And you know, so she's she's not just hot; she's she talented. Has, yeah, 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 I mean, she has to code switch right a fair amount. Yeah, and does that really well and plays both the kind of dim version right. of herself. She knows how to play the, for, I, I apologize if this word is offensive. Really she plays the bimbo well, but she also plays the knowing one well. And so like, it's a good, it, and, and also it's much more subtle than we're saying. It's like, it, it's, it's extremely well done. And also whoever clothes her, like the costuming on her is fantastic. It is. Oh, is, and the makeup. Yeah. Like I love the whole, you know, we were talking about how gorgeous it is. Yeah. And I do think one thing that they do that has Muff just didn't care about was really think through what the different like cultures look like yes. yeah. and feel like and how they dress and what would be different. Mm-hmm. And I love that they've made this culture just have a, an affinity for color. Right. Which totally right? makes sense. Like, yeah. yeah. They just, they, they put color into everything right. and they, their makeup goes around their whole face and it's beautiful. I want to add that I agree with you on Bel Rios, by the way. I particularly like the decision. I don't know. I assume this was not in the books, but it turns out that we discover, among other things, Bel Rios was this formerly, you know, incredibly heroic general who, by not listening to Day, winds up getting put in a penal colony. When he's finally freed, he learns that his uh, spouse thought that he was dead. And again, it was like a nice, well done thing where it turns out his spouse is a man. And like, you know, the relationship is really quite affectionate and tender and just not commented on it's it's it, it, it we've talked about this before you, you love it when the representation just is i like it when the representation just thing. is and this is a case where i think that was entirely appropriate because you would expect yeah. ten thousand years in the future they would be totally fine with that so that's yeah. that's incredibly well done that's a really it is a l- lovely little relationship yeah. because it's also a little complicated well there's work life stuff yeah like uh, you know yeah. yeah and that again which would be a, a, if it would be true if it was a heterosexual relationship so like it's it's again w- extremely well handled i think i like this okay. season a little bit better than the first season and i think the primary reason is that there is way less ir in this season what about Sarah Dan? That's like alliances and diplomacy. Sure, diplomacy. but that's just conventional meat and potatoes. IR. I have no problem with that. It's not <laughs> terribly interesting. But the first season with the whole psycho history bullshit, you know, oh, and yeah. like the the building of had like, it, and also again, I will never forgive this show for when Harry Seldon, you know, emerges from the vault to solve a centuries long, you know, interplanetary conflict with a five minute speech. That is not how life works. And I think that is actually my, I think it in the end is the fundamental thing that I can't causes me to never fully embrace this show because they can't obviously depart from the psycho history stuff too much, but it's bullshit, Anna. Well, I agree. It's yeah. total bullshit. And I, you know, once you make the decision to treat it as magic, yeah, like it's fine. You know, like it's it's totally fine because it is just magic. It's, and that it, and that to be it, fair, it, by the way, that actually I liked what Asimov did. Like you know, like the and this was the theme that from the first season as well. The sort of science, be you know, is 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 the the sort of science religion question in terms of faith and so forth. That's fine, but they don't press on that point too much, which is the right way to go, is the way I would put it. Because if they try to press too much on it, they're not going to have good deep thoughts on it. And again, I would argue what is represented in the book and in the TV show is not science. Yeah. They call it science, right. yeah, fair. but it's magic. Yes, yes. No, that's <laughs> point taken on that, yes. So yeah, like again, it's been enjoyable. I've enjoyed it, but you know, not... Let's move on, yeah. Dan. Let's move on to something we both enjoy. Oh, yes. Let's move on to something and, and listeners, we're going to apologize here because we, we intended, we had some aspirations we didn't mm. quite get to. But, you know, you're listening to this after having heard our, you know, Meg podcast, The Meg. And then we did Meg to the Trench. 
And as a joke, we were going to put a special episode in between for Megan and the three GAN, which is, by the way, by far the best. Which is a great idea. Yes, good idea. That was, and it was Hannah's idea. And also, by the way, the best of those three films by far, even though it costs the least amount of money. And it's really just a credit to Blumhouse in terms of like, you know, how they do nasty little horror films. But Anna, I was like pleasantly surprised by this because I mean, my what I'd heard about this film when it came out was that, it, it you know, audiences liked it. I heard that like a lot of people thought it was really silly. This isn't a silly movie. This is actually a really good, tight little film, I thought. And it it's funny that I guess and it's OK for parents. Yeah. Oh, this is easily OK for parents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I found it actually almost a little bit moving at times. Yeah. I mean, like it, 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 it evokes grief in a really serious way. It does. And then it's a very silly movie. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like it, you, it gives you the underlying issue that there is a, you have to deal with grief and there are good ways and bad ways to deal with grief. And then it gives you a hilariously bad way of dealing. with. Oh grief. God. Like, so, <laughs> so first of all, I have to add, like the movie, like literally, like comes out firing on all cylinders because the opening, sh- the opening sequence of that film is a horrible commercial for like a oh, fake yeah. furry thing, like you know, like a, a a pet. But but the premise is your real pets will die, but this one will never die. So you don't have to ever explain death to your children. Why don't you buy this? Right. And it, I just laughed my ass off. It was a great, great way of dealing with it. So it, it 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 has this so you get you yeah. get a real seri- you get a fairly well done pretty serious introduction into yeah. this poor child who has been orphaned who loses both of her right? parents right yeah and then loses both of her parents and then you get her aunt who is who the is worst a human ever terrible person the worst just person. a terrible person the worst person like I you know that's not really paid enough attention to no. what a terrible person she is well I let me this right and because yeah. it's Allison Williams she gets like, away you don't with think of it right. But like you don't think about it right away. You're like, oh, she's she's so pretty which, and she's so smart. Right, but I'm gonna add that's odd because she has previously played the worst person in a film, you know. Yeah. And she's actually yep. talked about this how in Get Out, you know, spoiler, you know, she is <laughs> spoiler if you haven't spoiler seen if you haven't seen it. <laughs> yeah, she's the bad guy in Get Out, and I, I, you know, she's she's been on interviews and on talk shows where she said that people have come up to her and actually said, but you really love him right like you actually didn't want and yeah <gasps> let, yeah like they can't believe she was actually evil in that you know and this is a slightly different uh movie because in the end she does learn some redemption and so on and so forth but for the first two-thirds of this film she is a horrible human being like just the worst you know as we have established i don't like kids <laughs> and yes. i would not behave like her no. like i think <laughs> If I had suddenly had custody of a child of a loved one of mine, right? I I think I would take my fucking headphones off every once in a while. Well, right? the other part, like, I yeah, mean, yeah. And and she because she's bad in two ways, right. right? Like she's bad in that she just literally just ignores the girl, mm-hmm. right? right? Just like neglects. Right, her. she's just obsessed and with then, work. Yeah, and says, "Oh, go ahead, play on your screen. Right. I don't care. I don't care." That, by the way, I, I will say yeah. as a parent that was I, I love that little moment because it's like that's the difference between a parent and someone who doesn't give a shit. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing she does is give her this doll. Yes. Which <laughs> Right. So that the, the Which yeah. only a idiot or only an insane person would think is a good idea. Right? True. Like Yeah. Like, and she does it. Like it actually the logic of the movie is really great. Which, no, right? to be fair, like because she does it yeah. in an effort to, to bring her out of her grief. Yeah. And not have to do it herself. Exactly. Yes. To not have to do the hard yes. work of addressing grief. This herself. is all about a character who doesn't want to do the work, or at least that kind of work. Yep. She's clearly willing to build yep. a, a doll. And also, again, I want to give credit. This is where I, and I, ha- I was curious what you thought about this. The thing the film does remarkably well, and I don't know if they knew this in advance, but like the Megan doll so perfectly captures the uncanny valley between. Yeah not you know between human and doll that it is innately creepy and the other thing that i think they did that was incredibly smart is a, a, some of this film you know the way they do it is there was a child actress uh played by annie donald i think and then they sort of put some cgi eyes on her but a lot of this i think they actually have a real doll and that was smart 
because the real doll is fucking creepy just innately. And so it, it winds up leading to a significant amount of dread, at least when I was watching the film. Anytime Megan was on the screen where I knew it was like clearly the doll, it just freaked me out. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually good. Yeah, no, like, it's, that's the thing. I think what we're good. saying it is it's good. not bad good. Right. Like some, it good. I read some critics who thought of it as like bad good. No, this is actually a great film. I'm not kidding. Like it, it, it brings up some interesting themes. It knows what it's trying to do with them. You know, it, it, among other things, I do think, I know you don't like kids, but Violet McGraw, who plays Katie, no, she's, she's great in this. She, and like the, the yeah. most affecting scene, actually, I think is when, and it's an interesting scene because it's disturbing in the, in retrospect, is when they're doing the big test for the board and Katie has been like brought in and she's clearly, she just cries. She just starts crying. And it's a very moving, effective scene. And Megan actually is able to comfort her. And so it, it gives some sort of like, motivation for why Megan actually winds up behaving the way she does in, in the second half of the film. It's, it's, it's a very well done movie and also tightly done. And there is a critique yeah. of capitalism. Oh God. Yes. Oh yes. <laughs> yes. Also good use of Ronnie Chang as, as the CEO, you know, great mm -hmm. use of him. Yeah. And also I, one of the things, the other things I liked about it again, not subtle, but clever is how, you know, particularly in the last 15 minutes of the film, Megan becomes less and less human looking. As they, you know, as they fight, yeah. like she, be, she starts looking more like Chucky and then like just, you know, just like a doll. But and also I, I'm just going to add again, I we need to praise movies that do this. This movie is only, I think, 100 minutes long. It is a <laughs> short film and it should not have been longer, to be clear. Perfectly well done as a short film. Well done on that. I would also recommend, by the way, because it's available on Amazon Prime now. Watch the unrated cut. Don't watch the theatrical cut. I watched the unrated one, but what's the difference? The difference is there's there's two differences, but they're big differences in my opinion. The first is is that yeah. in the uh, unrated cut, Megan actually swears at one point. She says "fucking" if you remember, and that actually yeah. worked. Like there's a moment where she says that. I was like, "Whoa, okay, this is like you think it gets dark and then it goes a little darker." Oh, that doll is serious. Yes. Yeah. The second thing they changed is that it, the scene where Megan kills Ronnie Cheng and her assistant, his assistant. Yeah. That is incredibly gore. You know, it's, it's pretty bloody in, in the version you watch. Apparently in the theatrical release, release you barely see anything. There's no oh, blood in that. Yeah. And like you, that need, that scene needs to be gory, I think, for it to work. Oh, and I'm sorry. I think so too. Yeah, I had one last thought about well, this. I was just going to say. Oh, that, that, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go, go. Okay. I was just going to say, so the critique of capitalism, yes. obviously, is that, you know, the exploitation of grief yes. and like, you know, trying to to solve death with with products which we do anyway by the way did you did you like the sequence though where the kids said where where like allison williams says yeah this would be really expensive you know like the, the, the that's the problem and she says if i had this toy i wouldn't want any other toy and you see allison williams eyes like light up like capitalism is awesome you know and so forth it was good although it does it is well it do you want a product that someone doesn't want any would make them not buy anything else. Probably not, That's but like it, it was in the context of the film, I think. Anyway, what I was going to say, what it really, the most deft, I think, kind of uh, critique of capitalism moment is actually when the board watches yeah. Megan comfort the girl yeah. and they're like, awesome, <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> and they just see like dollar signs. <laughs> like that's how they see it. No, I agree. I agree. You know, one, it's a, it's a good one last thing I want to say about Megan. Again, I highly recommend it. And I will say that I think the producers of the Meg franchise should watch this film. <laughs> I'm not joking about this because the thing that... Oh, you, yeah. I, I'm serious about this. Megan has... It's not just a good film. It has an appropriate nasty streak given the content. And I think the producers of the Meg need a slightly nastier streak making those films. And like Megan, actually, I think like is it's it, that's exactly the right level to pitch it to. So I would leave it at that. All right, next. All right, next, and something also we liked. We both liked. Yes, both liked very much. Yes, and we've talked about it before a little. We bit. have, but we, we need to talk about season two of Strange New Worlds, Star Trek: Strange New Worlds. On it, this was just I thought an utter delight. I have to say, I, I enjoyed the entire season. What say you on this? Utter delight, yeah. Um, Anson Mount is uh -huh. as good as his hair. Like I don't. <laughs> wow, know, I, that is really high praise. Very high praise. I know. I know. Yeah. His hair is extraordinary, <laughs> and he is too. <laughs> All of the acting is great. I'm going to give you credit for making this analogy first, yeah. which is that the show that it reminds me the most of is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yeah. It 
and it's I think it's that good. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's going to get the same kind of following or be the same kind of cultural phenomenon. Right. Well, I, but, I don't think it can be, to be fair, because there were, I mean, yeah. Buffy had a young female protagonist in a way that was kind of unique at that point. So, yeah. 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 But artistically, I, I, Buffy, I thought Buffy's a little funnier, but like beyond that, this show, the impressive thing about this show is the range of episodes it, it delivered this season in which it was tonally shifting from things like, let's explore the PTSD that comes with war to let's put on a musical. And it actually pulled both of those off, which a lot of, sh yeah. there, I don't, I, there, I don't, I can't think of any, any other show on television that would be able to have done that. And also a crossover with an animated show, the lower decks episode, which again, uh, incredibly well done. They took a ton of risks yeah. and all those risks paid off. Exactly. And I think it's a testament to, I think the acting and the writing yeah. are amazing. The and Go ahead. The other, We're just talking over each other a lot. I'm sorry. Well, we're, th we're enthusiastic we don't about have this. A script. Yes, exactly. Yes. But the way I would put it is that the thing that made this season, I think, interesting is that by and large, you know, the leads are Anson Mountain, Rebecca Romaine. They actually take a sort of, they're more in the background this season. There are other characters like Uhura has a whole arc. Sometimes literally. Yes, exactly. But like Uhura has a whole arc. Spock and, and Chapel definitely have a whole thing going on. You know, we see Ortegas a little more. Even Kirk, you know, is a recurring character in this. And and Leon Noonien Singh. But what's impressive about that is Mount and Romaine are always good when they're on screen. And it's like they're like, you know, they're like, they literally are the best supporting actors in the sense of just having them there anchors the whole show and allows all of these other actors to do what they need to do, which allowed them to like really stretch in ways that we hadn't seen before. Um, and so it, 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 I'm honestly, a lot of Star Treks, when they first start off, they don't, you know, the first season could be clunky or whatever. The first season of that show was not clunky. I think maybe because some of the characters had like a running start from discovery, but it, it, really I'm impressed by this second season and I want the goddamn strike to end so they can start making the third one is what I'm saying. Yeah. I, I want to give a shout out to Anson Mount's particular comedy chops. Oh yeah. I think are that. Yeah. He might be the best at that. Yeah. I mean, what is cool about him in this role is he does of all the, you know, of all the captains we've had, he does resemble Kirk the most. Mm -hmm. And that's fitting in the timeline of the show. Right. Yeah. right? Yeah. Not just because he's Pike, but because I think if you look at it, sort of a generation, it in the way that gender roles evolved yeah. Yeah. in the show right. timeline. Yeah. Right. So you're going to get kind of a macho captain. Yeah. But he is so much better than like, I love the original series. That's right, what right. made me a fan, yeah. all that. But you know, Shatner. <laughs> it's not just. I, I, it's unfair to blame not that on very Shatner. Generous. Yeah, yeah. Not a very generous sort of role, right? right? Yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't blame it on. I don't blame it on Shatner. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Although his, he does what he's supposed to do really, really well. That's one of the reasons this is such a great yeah. show, right? Yeah. Is he plays that macho guy right. very well? But Anson Mount has a um, a tenderness yes. to him. A vulnerability to is him. What yeah. A vulnerility yeah. to him and and that makes the comedy better mm -hmm. and that makes when he does go into captain mode yeah. it, it makes it less grating mm -hmm. and it makes him you can see why people follow him yes. and rebecca remain you're right she makes everybody better too yeah. and then also the vibe that they have together you totally believe yeah. it and also i love a good you know non-sexual chemistry in non-sexual uh, heterosexual dude, chemistry in, like you know Man, woman, yes, but I like yes. that. <laughs> to use the I love that. To use the how to get this get made phrase, it's a man woman scene, but there's no sex in it. And no sexual tension, which is good. It's a man woman <laughs> scene, but there's no sex in it. That's right. Yeah. I believe the word I was looking for was platonic. There we go. There we go. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but it's but in in just that level of chemistry right. without any romance. Yes. Yeah is I think pretty rare. It is rare and, and it's, they have great it, it's extremely well done. I want to give particularly a shout out to Re Rebecca Romaine for two scenes in the, in this season, which I thought were really good. The first is in during the lower decks uh, episode where she finds out she's a, she's on the poster and she's like, do you mean like a pinup? And the way she phrased that, <laughs> it's also a good meta moment because it's Rebecca Romaine. Because it's Rebecca, yeah. yeah, because it's Rebecca right, Romaine. But like, yeah. that, like, if that was a moment of fan servicing, fine. I was serviced because like it was just it, it's an incredibly well done scene. And then even in the musical episode, at the very beginning, where Laan is is in the transporter and they're br bringing beaming Kirk over, and you know she says to Laan, "You've got some heat coming off you." Like she she could tell that there was something going on with Laan and Kirk, even though 
for timeline reasons, you wouldn't have necessarily known that. Again, just done delightfully well. I think Lahan and Kirk is my favorite development of this season. Yeah. 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 I think I, I, I'm so bad with names in general. The actor that plays James Tiberius. Paul Kirk, Wesley. Paul Wesley. Uh, way too skinny. <laughs> way too skinny. Incredibly too skinny. Remember, this is seven like, years before just... like the original series is supposed to start. So like I, you know, yeah. can, well, I'm going to assume it just maybe, unbelievably maybe he was hitting the replicator hard. And then Christina Chong, plays La'an and she's she's also really good I also by the way I, the musical episode there were so many I, I don't, it's weird I think there are some people I think that don't like this episode and I'm honestly stunned as to why because I, if you don't like musicals that's fine but this was actually a great musical in addition to being a like you know like the, the the songs were pretty good and they they were smart in terms of who they had like belting out things as opposed to not so for example they have, I think, Celia Rose Gooding plays Uhura. You know, she was a Grammy winner. She's got the chops. She does. She has a great solo performance. Christina Chong also has a great uh, solo. Those are good. Oh my god! Oh, that the that I think hers might be the one that was the most surprising and maybe my favorite. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. But they also have good ensemble numbers. The first one where like you Sp- Spock starts singing and it's like I think the title was Apologies. It's a lovely little you know thing. It's it's not fancy, but it's incredibly well done. And then. Uh, Jess Bush, who plays Chapel, her number where she gets the fellowship. Like they were smart because they she sings almost like breathily in that one. It's almost like a Marilyn Monroe style kind of singing because she doesn't necessarily have a great voice, but it works. And it's much more a dance number than it is a singing number, but it works incredibly well. I was going to say that's our show number. Exactly. That's the show choir. Yeah, yeah. Number. But like, I like it worked yeah, really well. And also, there was a small moment in that one. I don't know if you caught this, where they're like they're all dancing. And Ortegas is like sort of boogieing around and then a taller woman is the one who lifts her up. And there was like clearly a little moment of heat between the two of them, which was 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 yeah. very funny. Sometimes representation <laughs> needs to be called out a yeah, little bit. Yeah, I, I could have been called out a little more. Yeah. One thing I think that they have is they have just made Ortega. They haven't tried to like code her in a particular way. No. Yeah, she has sort of a butchy kind of look yeah. but like we actually have no we, i don't think we know anything about what her personal preferences are which is fine like no you know, and that's totally fine yeah. because most of the time we don't with people we work right. with we just like work with them yeah you know yeah. speaking of people we work with yes let's go to the last thing on our okay list. what do you got on it's lower decks dan <laughs> yay i you you tried to turn me onto the show mm-hmm. maybe even like a year ago i don't remember and I was like, eh, I watched an episode. And I was like, this is boring. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, I don't care. And then I was in a funk a few weeks back mm-hmm. and needed something. You know, I've already done my office rewatch mm-hmm. like five times in the past three years. That's not true. I've done it twice in the past three years. <laughs> and, you know, I was like, oh, let's, let's try Lower Decks. That seems like a, a low stakes thing to right. watch and it is low it stakes is. and it's totally endearing yes. and i it's a good sitcom it's a good workplace sitcom mm-hmm. like it, it is i i think i have a, like a weird bias against like animated things for adults and this is definitely for but, adults just to be clear i mean like it oh it, it's for teenagers well. yeah. this also is I, i've said this before it is straight up the horniest star trek show of all of them yes yes it is yeah, yeah. <laughs> and but it's good uh, you know and uh, what's his face is very good. Jack Quaid. He's also in The Boys. Jack, Jack Quaid, Quaid, who plays Boimler. Which, oh my God! Yeah. We someday we should talk about The Boys, which I did enjoy. We but should, but that requires we'll me watching about. the next couple seasons, and I'm scared of that. The first season was good, but like I, I just it's so goddamn dark. But yes, yeah. it's dark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is very dark, yeah. and he's it, it shows some range because he's not dark in this one. No. but he he's totally adorable, and all the voice the the voice acting is great. Mm-hmm. I I did. Oh, you know what it was? I did watch the crossover episode right. and I was like, you know what? I'm going to give Lower Decks another chance because I enjoyed this crossover episode so much. Mm-hmm. And I was the right thing to do. I mean, I don't, I can't tell you anything that I, like some favorite lines or favorite scenes. <laughs> it's just like a great group of people that you like hanging out with. Sort of like The Office, like a great group. It's like, it's a, it's a familiar group of people mm-hmm. who you know their personalities, their personalities inter- intersect in an interesting way. 
and they get up to some crazy hijinks. It's a sitcom. It's a workplace sitcom. That's so it. the way I would put it is that, first of all, I'm glad to hear that you you really liked it because, again, I, I, I was pushing for you to watch it. And I agree with you. The voice acting is extremely good. Tawny Newsom plays Mariner. Don Wells plays Tendi. They're great. I think there are two things that make that show really pop. I, there are a bunch of scenes that I remember mostly the really weird ones. Like there's, there's a scene in the second season involving Mugatu sex that had me dying, just utterly dying. And I think that's part of the, I think this show has two things that, that make it really work well. The first is, is that what it knows what to do is to mine the sillier aspects of Star Trek. Like it has, it is borrowed from all of the other series the really silly, almost silliest like characters or silliest plot lines. So like it used the exo comps from next generation or the Bogatu from the original, sh- you know, series and like has no problem playing with those. It knows the sandbox it's in and it does a great job with that. And so th- I-, I will say this. I think the enjoyment of that show is only enhanced the more Star Trek lore, you know, because there's a lot of in jokes in, in, in the show. And particularly the sort of 90s shows, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager. It likes to, to plumb the depths of those. It's also, it, like The Office, yeah. it is pretty cynical, which I like to. So th- this like. is the second thing, though. It's cynical, but it has, the other thing it has, though, is this optimism, I guess would be the way to put it, about being in Starfleet. Fits into the Star Trek. Yeah. yeah. And it fits into the Star Trek. And this is where I way. think Strange New Worlds and, and Lower Decks, That's the I think that's the reason why the crossover episode worked so well is that the one thing that the shows have in common, they don't have a lot in common, but one of the things they do have in common is they are both, in the end, optimistic about what Starfleet can do, for lack of a better way of putting it. You know, they're the anti-Andors, but in a good way. And, like, my favorite character on Lower Decks, hands down, is Tendi. And part of the reason I love Tendi is because she's this Orion who is trying to bust the stereotype of what you think Orions are supposed to do. And so she's like super optimistic. She's a science nerd. She's an engineering nerd and she is boundlessly optimistic. I take it. You like the episode where she created the dog. I did like that episode. <laughs> I think also the episode, but I was going to say the episode, I think I might like the most yeah. is a weirder one. And I'm going to forget the name of the character that that's, that's the toaster oven that goes to the planet of the like winged. Thing oh, this is a, a peanut hamper. Yes. The exo comp, the yes. exo comp peanut hamper. Yes. yes. Where again, by the way, really funny sex scene in that episode. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hilarious yes. sex scene. Yes. We should, I thought of, I thought of uh, Annalie. Newman. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, a, it's a pretty also dark episode. Like, it's, it's a cynical episode. It's a dark yeah, episode yeah, yeah. in some ways, but uh, also ultimately. Yeah. Starfleet, Starfleet does the right thing. In the, the end. Yes. Starfleet does the right thing. Yeah. And also that character's right. Your name, name is Peanut Hamper and she's a coward. <laughs> yes. And she's a terrible, 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 person. terrible entity or terrible consciousness. Terrib- yes. Terrible toaster oven. Yes. 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 I also I like, I actually, I think that's, that is their special sauce. Cause you know, a lot of the plots for the, the seasons have been AI gone bad or like, you know, artificial intelligence gone bad. Cause there's, there's a couple episodes with Badgie voiced by Jack McBrayer. Oh yeah. 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 Which are, pretty funny as well so you know and then also i think my favorite the the sequence i think i've laughed the hardest at was i think this was in the last episode of the third season where they're trying to figure out what to do against the sentient computer who's got the ship and the security guy says let's eject the warp core and everyone dismisses him and then boiler says no no no, that actually is the thing we want to do this time because every he suggests it for every situation (laughs) yeah yeah, 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 yeah. you're right eject the warp core and everyone is like giving him high fives because jacks finally gets to do what he had been suggesting for years (laughs) you know and it was it was again just a a a well-earned character moment that that they made silly and it was it was great that way so Dan, we've reached the end of what we did with our summer vacation. <laughs> Do we have anything we're looking forward to? I I have thing I was looking forward to that now we have bad news, which is Dune's getting delayed till next year. I leave this way. You want to know what I'm looking forward to? I'm looking forward to the strikes getting resolved because this is clearly yeah. yes. Let's be honest here. You know what what we're now seeing is there a critique of capitalism <laughs> yeah. in this? The studios are clearly <laughs> in this timeline. The studios are starting to ration out what they've got in the can and. I, I'm, maybe that makes me weirdly optimistic that they're realizing, oh, damn, we actually need to like, there's going to be a point where they run out of stuff. And and I assume they think they're going to break the union before maybe that. Maybe CGI actors aren't the answer <laughs> after yeah. all, right? 
Maybe we should just pay the ones we that are live right. and breathing and stuff. So I, I'm hopeful for that then. I am also looking forward to We're going to have an episode on this when it comes out. The Creator. This is a... Uh, it was made by the director of Rogue One, Gareth Edwards. It's got a pretty good cast. John David Washington... And I'm sure, I, I know I saw the. It was the trailer with it was tra- it. the trailer with the Aerosmith "Dream On" song was on it. Oh yes, yeah. yes that yes. looks okay. that, that yes. looks amazing. Maybe it's because I keep seeing the trailer in the big screen, but it looks really goddamn good. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm also kind of looking forward to, and I didn't think I would say this, "Rebel Moon," which is the Zack Snyder thing. Yeah, like the trailer for that just dropped. I... I'm kind of intrigued by that. The Discord. Seems intrigued yeah. by it as well. So, sure, I'll take a look. Yeah. I'm worried in the end it'll be Snyder to death, but, like, you know, that was whatever. Well, you know. <laughs> 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 listeners, listeners, I regret to inform you that, that Zack Snyder is putting Anna to sleep. <laughs> what I was going to say is that the thing that we have discovered about Zack Snyder is that he is the person that has the vision and that yeah. if nothing else in his movies, like you're going to get a vision. Yeah. You may not like that vision. It may be a terrible vision, but, but at least he knows what he, he, he actually does know what he's doing. The question is whether we all yeah. agree with him, but he knows what he's doing. And so I, you know, or we want to see the thing. He's I doing. want to see the thing like, he's doing. He, I might not like it. And you know, but, yeah. but I, he's interesting enough so that I want to, I want to give it a whirl. So yeah. Fair enough. I was really looking forward to Dune, damn it. Dune 2, I guess. I'm well, it will come out eventually. Really... I mean, it's not like they're going to... They're not. Yeah, you know. I know. It's just... It's just... It's... it's he... It, I really... I'm going to have to rewatch the first yeah. one. I haven't because I kind of was like going to wait until the two and I was going to like do a rewatch right. of one, you know, right before two. But it's so gorgeous. Yeah. It's just so beautiful and so fully imagined that... It's the kind of movie that I just get excited to be in a theater for. Right, exactly. And excited to be taken to that place. And there's not a lot I get excited to be in a theater for. Right. You know? And and to be transported. Let me put it this way. So this is another thing where I'm optimistic because, again, we didn't talk about this because we – and maybe we'll do another episode in the future about this. But one of the things I legitimately enjoyed this summer was Barbenheimer. And by that I mean not just – the yes. films Barbie and Oppenheimer, but actually the experience of going to see them in the movie theater, which was lovely. And they were two very different films, both good, both interesting. And maybe this will encourage people. Did I miss my chance to see them in, in theaters at all? Uh, hopefully, no, I think they're still I, doing pretty well. You should you should go see them this week, though, Anna. I mean, like, I'm, I'm not kidding about that. Okay. Yeah. But, sure. and they, uh, but, yeah, I want to do yeah. that. I, I think, I, I don't think it's, a, I think it's an, it, it was something that started out as a stunt. Mm-hmm obviously, but is, I think, an interesting kind of lens. Yeah. You know? I think it was, it was, it was, it was counter-programming. It made sense that those two movies would be released on the same day because they are extremely different films. But they're both really nice to look at. They both have interesting things to say. I think Barbie's a little bit more of a mess than Oppenheimer, but there are also ways in which Barbie is more interesting. So, you know, live this way. I want you to watch them, Anna, so we can talk about them in a future episode. I'm aware that there's a critique of capitalism. Oh, just a little bit. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, that is the one reason we do this show. Yeah. Dan is just basically like we just wanted to talk to each mm-hmm. other about stuff, yeah. about things that we liked and things that we didn't mm-hmm. like also. But we hope you the listeners also had a great, you know, summer of 2023 and we are looking forward, you know, with the fall of of getting a little more serious and looking at a little more serious stuff. But yeah, really? Oh, we'll do some we'll do silly stuff. We'll do stuff some silly too. stuff too like, though. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, until next time. Keep this channel open for more.